All right. So welcome, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here on this latest episode of Birds and Bites, uh, the virtual program series for Chicago Ornithological Society. My name is Edward. I am president of Chicago Ornithological Society, and I'm super thrilled that you're all here with us this evening and for our speaker and topic here tonight. Um, before I hand it over to Leo Gaskins to uh, teach us all about the fascinating relationship uh, between birds and muskrats, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. First being, as I mentioned, we are recording tonight, so make sure if your camera is fine, it'll be on Leo, but make sure that you uh, have muted yourself. Um, I don't, you know, hopefully you don't want to have the sound of somebody's washing machine in the background, uh, which has absolutely happened on one of these programs before. Um, additionally, just if you have questions, we're going to have you guys put them in the chat box and then Leo will go through, we'll go through together and answer them at the end of the program. Um, so as they come up, you know, throughout the program, feel free to just go ahead and put them in the chat box and maybe they'll get answered in the course of the program or we'll get to them at the end. Um, so plenty of time for questions afterwards. And lastly, uh, if you are a member of Chicago Ornithological Society, thank you. And if you're not, well, why the heck not? Uh, by being a member, it's very cheap. It's one of the cheapest memberships you could possibly have in this city. Um, you get to support awesome free programs like this one, free bird walks across the city uh, and region for that matter, and support some really awesome conservation work. So with that said, I highly encourage you guys to head over to chicagobirder.org, check out what we're doing, check out some future programs and field trips, many of which are scheduled well through the end of the year here. Um, and hope to see you guys on a future program or bird walk, hopefully in person. Uh, definitely also a plug for the Christmas bird count, which is around the corner here. And there are just kind of a dozen Christmas bird counts that are happening in Chicagoland. And I highly recommend checking out one or several of them if you can. But with that said, if you guys have any questions, again, please go ahead and put those in the chat. We'll do the best to monitor it. But I will go ahead and pass it over to Leo Gaskins, our speaker here this evening. Leo, take it away. Hello, everybody. Uh, you can hear me. Okay. So, uh, my name is Leo Gaskins, and uh, my pronouns are he, they, and I'm a PhD student at Duke University, and also uh, I partner with Audubon Great Lakes to do research in, the, um, in this region. So, uh, today I'm going to talk to you guys about muskrats and marsh birds. So, maybe not the thing that you thought would come up through uh, this listserv, but uh, hopefully I'm, I'm hoping to kind of win you over to the muskrats by the end of this. Okay, so to start this out, we kind of need to talk about a little bit of muskrat natural history just to begin with. Uh, and so thinking about what, maybe you guys haven't seen a muskrat, they're kind of elusive, they live in marshes, and they're semi-aquatic rodents. So they are rodents in the sense that the rat portion of their name does kind of reference that. Um, they also are pretty small. They don't reach over five pounds. So we're talking about a very light animal <laughs> for how much effect that we're going to see that it creates in marshes. Uh, and to give you a sense of the scale of these, uh, they're smaller than a cat, bigger than a squirrel, and closer to the squirrel size, really. Uh, and note, if uh, they're often confused in photos for their cousins, the beavers, they are a lot smaller than them um, if you see them in person. And the best way to tell them apart, if you see the tail, the tail is very thin and long, uh, versus on a beaver, it's obviously a lot wider. And so um, that's the easiest way to kind of tell them apart. Uh, they both alter spaces, but in very different ways. In terms of how muskrats um, exist within marshes successfully, they do so by um, creating their homes. And we often call these lodges or dens. Uh, so muskrat dens are these sort of igloo-shaped type vegetation mounds. And muskrats, by the way, they're only herbivorous. So they're just eating lots and lots of plants. And then they'll use the plants that they uh, eat and consume and shred up. And they'll pile them up um, to create their home. Inside, there is an interesting chamber, actually. And so you can see like the cross section of what that den looks like. And so there is a chamber where they swim underneath it into there. Uh, and then it's above the water line. And in there, they raise their kits. And there's a picture of the kit on the top left. It's an orphaned one that was given to a wildlife rescue. And they're very incredibly small to give you a sense of scale of like how small these start out. Um, the kits are their babies. And they it's an incredibly well insulated area um, that is in the core of those dens. They also can burrow into banks, by the way. I'm just not going to talk about that because it's not really the, uh, relevant to the research uh, that I do, but um, that is an option as well. Um, and also sometimes gets into the issues where people think they're a nuisance because they get into like maybe water control um, structures and that kind of thing. 
But anyway, um, muscular dens, by the way, to give you a sense of scale, are really huge. So you can see a picture of me standing behind one that in the um, winter there was some snow on top of it. Um, and these can be, I mean, even four feet wide. So the size of these relative to the size of the actual animal creating them is kind of astounding, actually. Um, and they do actually live in them all winter. They do not hibernate. And so they are actively um, going in and out of these dens and swimming in and out of it uh, all winter. And there's, there's really, there's a lot of really interesting biological like dynamics going on there with muskrats and their biology in the winter. Um, so by creating this scale of a home inside of a wetland, they end up changing the wetland in an interesting and drastic way. And they do this through something we call ecosystem engineering. And ecosystem engineers, so we just have to talk about this as a definition, ecosystem engineers are things that either create, modify, or destroy, maintain or destroy uh, a system. Two really good examples of it are one, the cousin of the beaver is possibly the most classic ecosystem engineer that I can think of that exists out there. Um, by damming up rivers, they create um, areas of lower flow or called anabranching, and that completely changes riverine systems. Uh, and creates niches and habitats that don't normally exist there on, in undammed river. Um, so therefore, they're greatly modifying and then creating new habitat within those systems, therefore an ecosystem engineer. Coral, coral within a coral reef is also an ecosystem engineer. So it's the foundation species. It is creating that system. Without it, there is no reef. Um, so those two examples of um, ecosystem engineers that exist, and muskrats are a third example. So in terms of my research overall, um, beyond just working on this, uh, since I'm also a PhD candidate right now about to finish uh, their doctorate, I also look at ecosystem engineers, but in different systems that aren't the Great Lakes. So um, though I do work locally, I also work in uh, Monterey Bay in California, and I look at how harbor seals and sea otters alter salt marshes. So just another uh, type of marshland out there as well, but one that is marine influence, so more salty. Uh, but the uh, types of effects that I look at across different systems are similar, just different animals. So I look at how they change the community of animals, so the biodiversity of the systems, and also the structure. So how physically do those systems change when you have a either very large or very influential animal that comes into it and alters it? And that's exactly what I'll be talking about here today as well. So I have to introduce the area that I work in. Um, so the area that I work in locally in the Great Lakes is called the Calumet region. Uh, the Calumet region is an area that encompasses both South Chicago and Northwest Indiana along Lake Michigan. Um, so very, very South Lake Michigan. Uh, and it is very close to Chicago as well in terms of the geography of it. Um, and so, oh, and why Calumet? So a lot of reasons. Uh, one, it's a priority region for Audubon Great Lakes, who is my main partner in this work. Uh, and they've already restored over 2,000 acres of marshland in uh, this region, the Calumet region already. So there's plenty of sites to work at because they've restored them successfully. And uh, also we're along a, an absolutely enormous flyway, um, as many of you may know, uh, in the Midwest. So this is a really ideal place to conduct this work and see um, how it, might a muskrat change and alter a space. So this is the question I was specifically looking at. Uh, how do muskrats impact bird diversity and their use of marshes in this Calumet region? Um, and so here is how I hypothesize that they might do so. Um, so muskrats, uh, by generating the homes that we talked about, their dens or their lodges, um, those huge dome structures alter the space around them within marshes. So if you have to mow down, think about the amount of vegetation that is going into that enormous igloo type shape. You have to mow down many, many feet worth of vegetation in order to pile it up to create uh, that size of a den. And they are absolutely voracious herbivores in their own right, by the way. I mean, they're just mowing that vegetation right and left. And so by creating these dens, they help create a, um, it is a condition called hemimarsh. And hemimarsh is very, very important. So hemimarsh is uh, defined as a 50-50 uh, between emergent vegetation, which is plants, um, and then open water. So you can see it, it's not the most maybe like quote unquote aesthetic look, but on the top there, you can see something that we was considered to be like an interspersed uh, open water and vegetation state. And, and this is a picture um, on the bottom here that I took of a muskrat den in one in the study. So this is one that is here locally um, in Northwest Indiana. And you can see that this creates um, a sort of ring gap around the edge uh, where the muskrat has eaten the plants and it allows for that standing water to come in there as well. So you can see that it's creating that, we call it interspersion. So basically intermingling of plants and water and not just thick dense plants. So in terms of what would it look like if there were no gaps? This is what it would look like. Um, so this is what we 
call in every literature uh, like study you'll read where it talks about how you marks called emergent vegetation, which I think is kind of funny because emergent to me, uh, this is just my mini brand about the term emergent vegetation, but I think emergent vegetation sounds like it's kind of short, like it's just emerging out of the ground or it's recently germinating. But what actually it can manifest as is this Pragmites, which is a highly, highly invasive species that lives in uh, marshes in the Great Lakes in particular. Uh, and it is seven feet tall, as you can see in the photo, um, it's well above my head. Um, and so it kind of feels like emergent is maybe a bit disingenuous, but that is the term. Uh, so, but just think of it as plants. But to give you an idea of the density of it, I mean, it's hard to even walk through it uh, as a researcher, uh, let alone imagine trying to traverse this as say a turtle or a bird attempting to get through this, right? So that it matters in terms of creating gaps that allow things to more easily traverse uh, in the marsh that they live in. So in the sense, um, in a big sense, muskrats are ecosystem engineers just simply by create, breaking up that emergent vegetation, by actually creating space. Um, and creating space is a really big deal within marshes. Um, it creates niches for things to live, for things to move, for things to rest. Um, for things to also be above the water line because there's a lot of standing water in the system. So all is to say, um, muskrats, by creating their dens, by helping to create this heavy marsh state, which by the way, is what a lot of managers in the Great Lakes are trying to restore to. They want that 50-50 state. That's super ideal um, to work towards. Uh, and we know that healthy marsh bird populations are dependent on healthy hemi marsh. Uh, so therefore, by helping to naturally create hemi marsh, uh, muskrats are then indirectly assisting with bird populations. So this blue arrow is showing you the indirect effect of muskrats through a series of, of things are in, influencing uh, potentially bird populations. So this is my thoughts anyway. So I wanted to study this and look into this further, um, if it was possible that uh, this was occurring. So to evaluate this, I took a two-pronged approach. One uh, was that I put up cameras to just directly look at, hey, what is using the muskrat dens? What's using these gaps that they're creating? Uh, and then two, looking at models, so looking at the relationship between bird occupancy rate and den density within marshes across Calumet. So I'll just go through them in order and talk about the cameras first. So the design of this is incredibly simple but powerful. Um, you put a camera on an area that has a muskrat den and does not have a muskrat den, and whatever the difference is, is the effect then, right? Because you have a baseline um, as to if uh, we're using this emergent vegetation as the control, um, well, then we know what happens uh, based on what we see show up in the den photos. So uh, I have seven pairs of these. So one camera facing the den and then one camera facing away towards the vegetation. So seven pairs total. I spread them out across three different sites within Calumet. I programmed the cameras to take one photo every five minutes and then I left them out for two weeks. Um, and weirdly, this was kind of a risk because uh, the photos, taking a photo every five minutes, uh, a lot happens in four minutes and 59 seconds. Uh, lots of things can move. And these birds, as you all know, being birds are really quick. Um, and so the idea that something might either hang around for five minutes straight or just happen to be uh, caught as it's passing through the frame very fast, you know, that is definitely a risk to do every five minutes. But there becomes a point at which if you're taking a photo every 10 seconds, there's too many to go through um, on that many cameras. But anyway, I put, put it out um, for every five minutes for two weeks long, and I uh, got back the images and looked through the SD cards, and I was floored to see over a thousand animals within the photos um, that I got back, which is absolutely insane and so much more than I ever expected to see. Not only that, a 21 fold increase from the control amount of uh, animals and photos to the muskrat den. Um, and that was crazy. 21 fold is by the way, just ecologically speaking, like absolute bonkers, um, it's a technical term. And so uh, this landslide here is telling me Something is happening here. Uh, it is clear that the muskrats, by uh, simply acting and just naturally behaving, are having a pretty profound effect here on the wetland. So, of course, um, I want to show you what showed up <laughs> and, and show you the pictures. So that's the really exciting part. At least it was really exciting for me to go through these. Uh, and if I told you that the number one animal that I saw was a species of rail, you probably wouldn't have believed me early on here, but it actually was. So soras were the number one species that I saw across the cameras. And this was done during spring migration season, by the way. And um, that floored me personally, um, as a birder is often confounded by looking for rails. And they were often seen within uh, the frame and they would be foraging, so kind of bending down, just like you're seeing in this photo uh, there. And probably going after insects would be my guess that are really drawn to these essentially rotting gigantic piles of vegetation. And um, so I saw a number of those and I was really thrilled about that. 
Um, if you're thinking, you know, wait a second, the vegetation would be a lot thicker and perhaps it'd be harder to see that. That is probably the best and most reasonable criticism of this uh, setup. But of course, you are directly testing structure. So that has to kind of be an element of it. And there has to be a difference there. Um, but I will counter with this. Um, so in the blue circle, you'll see that there's a sore bending over and foraging there in the vegetation in the control site. Most of the birds that we're looking at are wider than a piece of cattail or a piece of phragmites, which are the two dominant types of vegetation. Uh, and so with a trained eye, because it took me a while to train my eye to actually spot these things, um, I was able to pick up on at least, I think, a pretty substantial number of what was there. You know, of course, there's possibly some things that I missed, but I do think that the numbers uh, themselves are actually pretty accurate. Um, but I something I just need to address for sure. So um, and the biggest uh, species, one of the biggest species that I saw just in terms of number was redwing blackbirds. And uh, redwing blackbirds are a personal favorite of mine. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that they were showing up in such a number there is because as I was conducting uh, the fieldwork to set up and uh, take down the cameras, I saw uh, one of their nests nearby, beautifully braided uh, into this cattail here. And I wonder if they were uh, foraging either to grab material to build this nest or also to grab food in order to feed their young as well. Um, so both are definitely options as to you know what would drive something to use these spaces. Uh, in terms of waterfowl, the number one uh, that I saw was blue winged teals, which are awesome. And they were seem to be incredibly attracted to the open water and to be swimming by the edges of the dens. So um, that was really uh, fantastic to see. Swamp sparrows are the number one sparrow I saw, just really, really living up to their name, uh, which you know I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate that greatly. And so I saw a number of them standing on top of the dens, which was really exciting to see. Um, and probably the one that sort of surprised me, but I was absolutely thrilled uh, to see show up were black crowned night herons, which are not only just awesome uh, animals in their own right, but also are state endangered in both Illinois and Indiana, so in the entirety of the Calumet region. And um, I, be sitting, they would be sitting on the edges of the dens, uh, probably waiting to forage. And it, uh, it was really cool, and particularly this photo kind of tells the story of the whole study that I did. Uh, you see this interesting coexistence between, on the left, a black crowned night heron, in the center, a uh, foraging Sora, and then on the right side, a muskrat just chomping away, <laughs> contributing to this huge feeding platform, essentially, that they're creating. And uh, there's an interesting uh, facilitation. So uh, muskrats are creating spaces that positively impact other species. That's uh, what facilitation is. Uh, so that facilitation effect uh, is clearly there, but there's also an interesting, you know, coexistence at the same time of these animals showing up. So I found that really fascinating, and the photos um, were really personally exciting for me to go through, along with the results being incredibly strong. So birds were not the only thing that showed up here. However, they were 85% of what I saw, but they weren't everything. And so I also want to just briefly mention some of the other things that I saw on these stands that weren't birds. The number one thing that I saw that wasn't a bird on the dens were, well, the muskrats themselves, probably un unsurprisingly. Uh, and here's one uh, very much uh, busy and coming up and putting a little bit of extra vegetation on the top of its own den. Uh, now, muskrats have incredibly distinctive home. I mean, there's just nothing left quite like this. And so not only do people know what muskrat dens look like, because people, by the way, hunt muskrats there, um, uh, legally hunted fur bearer throughout the Great Lakes, uh, but the other thing that knows what muskrats look like are their predators. And so I also captured this image of a coyote plunging its head into a muskrat den, I'm sure to access that chamber that's in the center that it knows is there. Um, and I have to say, it is interesting to know that I have already peaked in terms of my entire career of camera trap shots that I'm ever going to get. I cannot believe that I got this on a five minute timer shot. Um, so I screamed when I opened this photo, uh, when I was going through these, it was super exciting. Uh, I, by the way, if you're wondering about the muskrat that we just saw that was on top of this den, it made it. Um, the muskrats do show up later in the uh, frame after this uh, occurs, but it's possible that it maybe got the kits if they were inside the den, but yeah, the, the coyotes also uh, need, need a meal. So here's the coyote, um, either in a food coma or contemplating its life choices. Uh, and yeah, this was a really fascinating predation event to so see the interaction uh, not only just what shows up, but how do things interact within these spaces as well. So muskrats are creating a, just a really unique and, and interesting environment within these marshes. Uh, the other thing that showed up were reptiles and amphibians, uh, notably the common snapping turtle actually showed up. 
it's a really, a really large animal. And you can kind of get a sense when you're looking at this photo uh, of why having a gap in a marsh might be useful just in terms of traversing it for something like a turtle, right? I would much rather walk through a gap than I would incredibly dense uh, vegetation. So all in all, um, I saw uh, 18 different species uh, in total on top of the dens. And so it was a pretty widespread. I also want to highlight that I think this is likely an underestimate of the true number of species that actually were using these spaces because it was a five minute timer. I think plenty of things passed in that four minutes and 59 seconds that I didn't see or just didn't catch. Uh, and that is kind of mind blowing to me that what I saw, despite it being an absolute landslide and a really strong result, uh, that there probably is even more out there. So incredibly interesting and promising. So you may be thinking, well, spring migration is interesting, but there are other times of year that birds are using these marshes. So I also looked at summer nesting season. I wanted to see how did this vary and did the strength of this effect um, also continue uh, at other times of year. So similar methods. I did have to drop uh, some of the trail camera pairs and I'll talk about why, but this is on the same exact dens, by the way. I didn't change up the dens. I'd use exactly the same uh, mounts for the cameras this time, same sites, all, everything is, is equal here, except for the numbers of cameras. Uh, and I'll talk about why. So, you know, I have to also talk about the fact that field work sometimes just does not go as planned and that is just the way ecology works. Uh, so here is a picture of one of the dens that I studied during spring migration and this is April 17th of last year. Now in under two months, this is the same den. And to give you an idea, like Phragmite is, is just that crazy in terms of its growth. It I had to double check to make sure that this was the same um, spot uh, because I it was unrecognizable to me even after having looked at hundreds of these photos. Uh, and so um, to give you a sense of why Phragmite is such a successful invasive species, uh, it grows really fast. It preempts space. It's so tall that it can shade out other things. I mean, this is a really active demonstration of why uh, it is as successful as it is in terms of its invasiveness. Uh, so this was camera did not work out in terms of getting data from it because, well, I can't really see anything and also it grew through the den. So uh, that's why some of it is lower replication here. Um, again, going back to this emergent vegetation, you know, um, another thing that came up was just recovering the cameras was really difficult uh, for me because you can see I the person that's taking this photo of me on the left is just feet away from me. So the visibility was so poor uh, that I had trouble relocating my own cameras, which Unfortunately, uh, by the way, when they study these cameras, they're usually used by hunters, and I'm just using them for a purpose they weren't really necessarily intended to be used as uh, for research. But they're also camoed, which is great, I guess, in theory, but not when you're trying to find them in seven feet fragmites. Um, so that's actually where the camera is that, in that circle. Um, but let me tell you, I even though I had GPS points, walked in circles around my own gear at moments because it was just so difficult to see it. So that was another uh, kind of interesting issue that I didn't quite think of. Uh, I'll be putting a lot more neon uh, on the cameras next time I run this study. The other thing that I ran into that was interesting that also created uh, some weird things with the data was overheating. So you can see that this camera, because it does record temperature, uh, recorded 104 degrees. It definitely was not 104 degrees in Chicago last year during the summer. Um, and I think that's an effect of uh, put something with eight batteries in it uh, in a marsh uncovered in the middle of the summer and it's very hot and humid, sometimes it can overheat and that causes it to malfunction uh, in some ways. So that was kind of interesting. And I, I say this because I think people often present uh, field work as if everything just went flawlessly. Uh, no, you definitely learn lessons and the problem solving aspect of it to me, the kind of almost you know puzzle of it and the logistics that you have to do, I think that's part of, of the fun. It's the adventure uh, of it as well. So I'm not gonna, no suspense here. Uh, this were the results. So. Uh, again, I saw an incredibly a huge increase in the amount of animals that were using these regions that muskrats uh, had dens in versus the controls, a 12-fold increase. Um, that kind of makes sense to me. During spring migration, obviously, you just have a lot more animals just in those spaces. So that stacks, and it definitely um, still have, supports the same hypothesis here. So this is the first two weeks of June. I'm also going to show you the photos of um, what I saw here on the cameras. So uh, the marsh wren. Um, really cute. Sat on a lot of things that I saw in the photos. Swamp Sparrow again, living up to the name. Look at that, sitting there really cute on the uh, piece of cattail. 
and mallard. So I saw ducklings. So a big thing, reason I wanted to look at this was to see were baby animals using these spaces or were things just directly nesting on the dens themselves? And there are things that do nest on them, namely Canada geese, actually, um, the best birds, by the way. Uh, and I, uh, so I saw these mallards, which was really fascinating. They show up in a number of the photos there um, as well. But the one that really floored me uh, was this one. I saw a baby sandhill crane. And I apologize for the fogginess of this. I, unfortunately, that kind of happened. But you can see on the left and on the right are the parents that are bending over, much like the photo on the bottom corner here. And in the center, there's a kind of puffball with legs uh, baby sandhill crane that all appear to be foraging atop these dens. So it's kind of incredible that within just a two-week span of taking photos that I even saw this at all. Uh, but clearly, these do not only serve a purpose uh, for animals that are migrating through, but also for animals that are nesting and stay um, throughout the entirety of the summer here as well. Um, reptiles also were featured pretty heavily within the photos that I saw, um, shockingly. I didn't see any snakes at all during the spring um, and then during the summer, probably because of just temperatures and seeking out these spaces for thermal regulation, uh, I suddenly started seeing a number of common water snake on the dens. And, um, and proving that they are very spunky, I also saw this photo of a red-winged blackbird swooping upon the snake uh, that's in the middle of that den, probably just chilling and trying to uh, heat itself up because they're cold-blooded. Uh, and the uh, red-winged blackbird had an uh, issue with that. I mean, I feel it. I've been swooped by many a red-winged blackbird in my time. So they're, uh, they're equal opportunity swoopers is what I've discovered. So the number one animal that I actually saw across the summer nesting season photos was not a bird. It was actually this common snappy turtle, which was uh, kind of interesting and, and stunning. So there was a shift that sort of happened there. And this common snapping turtle would just hang out here. It would rest. It would just walk around. Um, this sort of acts like an island, the den. And it's always above water level, right? Even no matter how much flooding there is. And it varies with rain, by the way. The water level goes up and down. Um, but the other kind of interesting thing that I saw that I was surprised by on the cameras uh, was this shot. And the turtle stays static like this, but kind of almost with its back legs burrowed into the den. And looking at the literature, I believe what is happening here is that this turtle is laying its eggs on the top of this muskrat den. Which, let me tell you, based on the muskrat's behavior in around this set of photos, I don't think that they talked about, you know, leases or uh, you know thinking about uh, splitting the space or condo agreements or HOA fees because the muskrat was pretty hot and mad about this arrangement and it would just keep trying to bury it with vegetation every time the uh, turtle would come by. So really fascinating. Um, I kind of expected maybe to see a bird nesting on top of a muskrat den, but I not in my wildest dreams that I think I might see a reptile uh, instead nesting on top of it. Unfortunately, the camera, just in the two weeks I was capturing photos, it doesn't go long enough to see if they hatched, but I would have loved to know if this was a successful turtle nest, potentially. So, fascinating food for thought. So, as I alluded to, there was a shift in what used the dens. Uh, in the spring, on the right, you can see it's just, it's 85% bird. It's pretty much all birds, which I would expect during spring migration season. During the summer, though, it was incredibly interesting to see the amount of reptiles that suddenly uh, ended up using that space. 37% uh, of what I saw were reptiles, and only about 30% were birds. Um, still large numbers, but that's an interesting uh, and fascinating shift to note there. Um, okay, so all this to say, by the way, that there definitely seems to be an indirect effect happening here between muskrats and birds, and so I'll keep talking about that uh, with these models. So beyond just looking at, okay, what is physically using spaces, taking pictures of them and quantifying the numbers within photos. I also want to do some modeling to see uh, on a high level, how do these numbers correlate? So I looked at bird occupancy rates and den density. Occupancy rates, by the way, it is not a measure of population, it is a measure of probability. So it goes from zero to 100 or zero to one, uh, basically. And so zero being, uh, we don't think there's any probability this bird showing up and one being like, you'll definitely see it. It's, it is incredibly like, is 100% likely to be in that space that you are uh, looking at. So think of it as like, uh, yeah, percentage basically of likelihood. So um, muskrat den density, however, which is the thing we want to compare it to, um, we didn't have that data. We had the occupancy data from the Audubon uh, research that already exists every year. They do a marsh bird survey. So they're already uh, taking into account like, okay, what, how likely do we think this is space, a bird is to exist in the space. And they're doing uh, call playbacks and lots and lots of counting. Some of you guys may participate in this. 
Uh, but the marks per monitoring data is where we derive the bird occupancy rates from. These bird occupancy rates are done annually and they go back to 2017. However, in terms of getting muskrat den density, which was certainly not being captured in a marsh bird monitoring survey, um, I can't go back to 2017 and physically walk through the marsh and count them, right? So if I wanna understand how does den density impact the occupancy rate of a species of marsh bird, um, I have to come up with some clever way to do it. And the way I came up to do it was look at looking at Google Earth. So thankfully, muskrat dens are so big, you can see them through space. This is a satellite image and you can see the dotting within these marshes, and the white lines, by the way, are just guidelines for me to help count them. And I counted them one by one, and I went through each of the images from every year from 2017 uh, to 2021. Um, and there's a really distinctive kind of almost dot with a donut gap shape, which is them having to mow down enough vegetation, they actually can pile it up into a igloo that is large enough to live inside of. And um, this was the trick to getting every single year's worth of den density so I could actually use all the bird data that we had. This is a very, very high density site, by the way. It's one of the highest density sites. But to give you a sense of just how many muskrat dens can exist within the space, uh, this is Grant Street Marsh in Indiana. Uh, so a setting kind of But it was absolutely, uh, it was floored me to see how many muskrats there were around. And it waned and waxed and waned a lot throughout the years. So this is what those correlations look like. So um, on the y-axis on the left, you see the occupancy rate from zero to one. So the probability that a bird will be existing in that space, essentially. And then on the bottom, you have the muskrat dens. And you can see that there are varying relationships with these. But these are four birds for which muskrat dens are a significant um, aspect to explain them showing up in these spaces. So um, why are the shapes different? It's, it has to do with their life history. So uh, a coot and a gallinule are very closely related. So it makes sense that those top two would probably be more similar in terms of their response to uh, muskrat den density. Uh, whereas a marsh wren and a pie grebe would have different requirements and things that uh, they would want uh, out of a marsh. Uh, so that would, if muskrat dens are in some ways kind of a proxy for a changing structure, um, that sort of makes sense as to why those birds might react differently to that. Uh, but it gives you a sense that, yeah, in fact, even at scale, not just on the singular um, den that I'm putting a camera on, but even at a wide scale, the amount of dens that you have in a space does make a difference as to how the birds uh, react to the spaces. So that's what these models were getting at. So all is to say, between those camera studies and also the modeling, this strongly suggests that my hypothesis was correct, and that there's a mechanism that where by muskrats, by creating their dens, by helping create the hemi marsh, are actually facilitating marsh birds through a positive species interaction. And positive species interactions are kind of what they sound like. It's one species that is positively influencing another. Uh, and this is really exciting and really powerful. And this is something that in ecology we often look for um, throughout systems because they're used to help conserve or restore uh, animals as well. So knowing that this positive species interaction exists, um, how can we harness it? That's basically the future direction of my work. I uh, really want to continue to work on this for the next few years. And so what do you do with that uh, information is where I'm go going next. And so the big way you can do this, or one of the potential methods would be to give this information to the Department of Natural Resources, the DNR. So muskrats, as I kind of alluded to, they are actually actively trapped um, as fur bearer species. So they're game species that are managed at a state level. And um, uh, people trap them by just putting traps out next to the dens often. Uh, but anyway, um, muskrats have trapping limits uh, that are associated with them. And so the other thing that the states, so the same group, the DNR, also keeps a track of is state endangered birds. So some of the birds that I've been uh, talking about today, like the common gallinule or the marsh wren or the black crowned net heron, they're also directly managed by the same group. Um, they're a non-game species, but state endangered birds also fall uh, under the purview of the DNR. So by using trapping limits on a game species, if they could indirectly facilitate through a positive species interaction, the state endangered birds that they also manage, that's incredibly powerful and something that the DNR would, is certainly very interested in and something I've been speaking to them about. Um, and so this offers a really powerful avenue uh, by which to use this work. And so that would be one of the things that I would shoot to be able to give them as a kind of plan as to like, yeah, how could you use a trapping limit on a game species to uh, assist with bird conservation? So hopefully across 
uh, this talk, you've maybe come to the conclusion that muskrats are friends of the birds. Uh, and that next, maybe next time that you uh, see a muskrat scurrying on, scurrying on by to its home, you'll think, oh, like that's a pretty awesome uh, mammal over there. Uh, and perhaps you'll uh, consider them a little bit differently or positively as you see them. They're pretty cute too. So I'd be remiss if I did not thank all the people that helped me do this field work. It was hot, long, hot, sweaty days uh, in a marsh, but hey, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and um, so yeah, thank you to Audubon and thank you to the volunteers that helped me out as well. I also need to thank the per people that funded this work, which is the National Science Foundation and my partners, Audubon and Duke, and also the people that gave me permits in order to use their land, the Forest Reserve of Cook County, Chicago Parks District, and the Little Calumet River Basin Development Commission, uh, who allowed me to place cameras on their land to conduct this research. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. All right, so real quick here, uh, a quick round of virtual applause for Leo. Thank you so much uh, for sharing this incredibly fascinating work um, and how important these connections are. Uh, I, I think everybody here on this program probably recognizes the fact that you know birds don't exist in a vacuum, right? They, they, they have interactions and connections that are deeply tied with all kinds of organisms around them. Um, and it's just really neat to see uh, certainly one that I think a lot of people don't see coming uh, and how, you know, critical this is. Um, so I know there's a couple of questions in the chat, but one that I'm going to go ahead and abuse my privilege here to just ask, I mean, how common at this point are muskrats in the Calumet region? It's not an animal most people see every day or any day. Um, is this is this something that is selects single select areas or are they very much a you know, common species that is engineering ecosystems all around us actively? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So their numbers, generally speaking, throughout the Great Lakes have drastically declined. Um, and so they're less of a presence than they probably once were um, in aggregate across the Great Lakes. That being said, at least in the areas that in Calumet, uh, there's just 32 different marshes that I was looking at that uh, gave data to the models. Um, they're all present. There are no sites that had zero muskrats, but there were some that certainly had maybe a difference of like 30 versus 400, which is a pretty stark difference, or at least dens that I was counting. Um, I definitely suspect based on the literature that their populations and therefore their influence on marshes has drastically declined over the years. Um, when you read old literature from like the 1940s about them, what they're speaking about, I've never seen. Um, and so that's kind of startling in a way because you you know you see the effect here and you think like oh what what did it used to be, um, but yeah I would say muskrats depending on where you're looking they might be common but it's not uniform. Um, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, certainly. Um, so we have some questions in the chat here. I'm gonna go ahead and ask just to kind of shake things up so you all aren't looking at my face and hearing my voice. Um, first one I hear I've got is from Michaela and Corbett. Do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, I, th um, I just wanted to know when you showed that um, map with the little dots that you said are muskrat um, dens, how do you know they're not beaver dens? Um, I guess it's, you're always doing a best case guess, or I did, I did my marking conservatively. So anything I saw was gap that was about the right shape and size, uh, I marked it. I suppose it is not impossible that there could be some kind of small shape that a beaver created that could have gotten confused with it. I would imagine they would show up just differently um, in terms of the shape and the effects around them. Um, but it's always kind of a conservative estimate. So I guess I can't necessarily rule out uh, that. But just in terms of density, there just wouldn't be that many beavers um, in a given space, certainly not at the same level as the muskrats. So not exactly a full answer, but you can't completely rule out that they live together. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a request here. If you could go back to the uh, the slide with the graphs of den density and birds present. Um, and while you're doing that, uh, I got a question from uh, David, David Zaber. You wanna unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, thank you. It was an excellent presentation. So in your study, did you see any mink? 
because mink do prey on muskrats. They do. You know, they, they did not show up on the cameras. So either they were just really quick and they just weren't around long enough that I got them on the five minute timer or they just weren't highly present perhaps in for some reason in the areas that I had the cameras out in or maybe they're camera shy. I don't know. Uh, you never know. But the yeah, I didn't see any, but I, that was something that I was curious about for sure. Um, I will uh, it, it give you an anecdotal um, support of their decline. I've worked in wetlands in the Great Lakes for 30 years and uh, definitely have seen declines, including in areas near <clears throat> Madison, Wisconsin, that had huge numbers of historic muskrat dens and just plummet. So um, it's water qualities to a large extent, but excellent, excellent talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's that. I mean, there's areas where I was reading papers where it was something like a 96 decline percent decline in muskrat den cover that when looking at old maps versus new ones, and that was startling to say the least. <laughs> uh, thinking about that, I mean, and there's yeah, tons of reasons why that's happening. Um, Marine McDonald, you got a great question here. You want to mute and ask it? Sure. Um, so. The first time I ever saw massive amounts of muskrat dens was um, at Horicon Marsh in the boardwalk area. Um, and the first time I went there was in 2020 and they were just everywhere. And there was a goose nest on top of every den. It was like, I'd never seen anything like, like it. So it was incredibly yeah. interesting. And then every time I've been back since then, there's not very many dens. I don't know. It seems like the water level's a little higher, but it made me really wonder like what's important to muskrats if we're trying to help them reestablish as well. So curious your thoughts. Yeah, which is a great question. So yeah, so one of the things is certainly water level. Uh, it needs to be high enough that they could create a den and swim underneath it to get into that uh, because without that mechanism, it just doesn't work. So if they're trying to create those lodges, Water level is absolutely a factor. And it is something that's also actively managed as well. So it becomes an interesting uh, potential conflict of interest if you're trying to uh, manage for muskrats and other things as well. Um, so that's one aspect for sure. Uh, water quality, um, as was mentioned, matters as well uh, to them in terms of the health. Um, these, den uh, these marshes are also actively burned um, on purpose through controlled burns. A uh, vegetation house is highly flammable. They do not survive those. The homes themselves do not survive those burns, as you can imagine. Um, and so the muskrats have to move while those are happening to get out of the way. Uh, that would be another effect. And then there also is another aspect to their biology where even if their populations are very, very healthy, they naturally go through these boom and bust cycles is like what they're called in the literature. And so they'll have like a really huge year, they'll eat all the vegetation, and then the next year they will just completely crash down. So there is an aspect of it that is just fluctuating um, as well. But that being said, we still have compromised populations uh, even now that we're dealing with. So I still think that that fluctuation is happening in a way that is, is a bit unusual as well. Thanks. Uh, Eric Myers has a question that I'm also very curious to hear the answer to. Eric, you wanna unmute and ask? Uh, yeah, hello. I was just wondering if you've ever seen uh, muskrats eating Phragmites. I'm always hopeful that something's going to be eating that in the ecosystem. Yep, absolutely. Um, so I did vegetation surveys to see uh, what comprise the dens, the, the top of the dens. I didn't, I wasn't destroying any of the dens, but just looking at the top of it, what comprised it, and it was a combination of the invasive cattail species and the in invasive Phragmites, um, and. I also did surveys looking at what was around the dens to see if it was reflective of uh, what I saw in there, which it was quite reflective. Um, and so based on that, you know, without doing a, like a gut content study or looking at their poop, um, I would say that they absolutely do eat their phragmites and they can make it work uh, with something that they wouldn't have been naturally have evolved to, to deal with since phragmites wouldn't naturally overlap at all with muskrat. Um, native ranges, which is really fascinating. So it gives you a sense of their uh, adaptability, which is cool. But yeah, good news uh, for the Fragmites front. I got a few more here. So uh, Robert Lorzel has a great question. Robert, you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, uh, thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. So 
this kind of goes outside of marshes, but I've seen muskrats in places like Belmont Harbor and Montrose Harbor. So I'm one. I have two questions. One is when they're in that sort of environment, do they live in a different type of habitat or do they not have the same sort of structure they build? Uh, and the other second question is near there, I often go watch these beavers and their beaver lodge. And I've seen muskrats right around the beaver lodge, but I don't see a muskrat house nearby. So I'm wondering, like, do they somehow sneak into the beavers structure or how do they cohabitate or whatever? Yeah. Um, so though the study that I did focused on the lodge aspect um, as a part of the mechanism uh, that I hypothesized, it is not the only way that they um, are able to exist. So they can burrow into mud banks as well um, and create that similar sort of chamber uh, as well. So that would be another way that they would do it. it I would just look around for little holes that they're running into, and that would probably be where they're living and raising their uh, kits. And and some of them just, it, depending on, I mean, muskrats have a humongous range throughout the United States, so it actually varies quite a bit in terms of what they do. But some of them, I have heard other people anecdotally speak of muskrats just not making houses at all. If it isn't, you know, harsh enough in terms of the winter uh, that it would kill them or something, you know, maybe that effort isn't necessary. Uh, so I have not seen that personally, but that is fascinating to me if that is the case. Uh, so there are a few other modes by which they can do home building uh, that aren't just uh, the massive igloo type, basically. I'm interested to hear that they're in Belmont Harbor. That's kind of wild, though. That, that's a really interesting place to see them. I'll throw in that I have also observed a handful in the Chicago River, uh, especially that area known as the Wild Mile. There's a couple mm -hmm. that seem to hang out there frequently. That's cool. uh, munching, munching their plants. <laughs> um, all right. And then I think the last question I've got here in the chat is from oops, um, curious why why the, the marsh wrens basically chart is so radically different from the others. Mm. I definitely think part of it is just simply life history varies between these four or well, more so between Coos and Gallinus are kind of but the, it varies between the four uh, overall. Uh, another thing is that, um, so I want to keep continuing to do these models because since it's from 2018 to 2021, it's just not a lot of data points on the um, axes here. And so I think if we extend this out to many more years, that it'll smooth out a little bit. I think part of that is just that my guess is that we have more muskrat den um, data points they're, they're sort of clumps, right? They're not extremely, not perfectly spread out. Um, and also, it's not a lot of occupancy rates that are really well spread out over time. Um, so my guess is that it's not that that's an untrue result, but that it probably would be a lot better in terms of the prediction uh, if we simply just had more years in the model. Um, and I'd be curious to see if that holds as we add more data in there or, or doesn't. Um, so this is still definitely... Uh, early in terms of uh, our data collection, but it, it's certainly fascinating and promising. But yeah, I have also uh, scratched my head over the marsh ring graph as well. Well, then I think we'll go ahead and close things out here. So once again, huge, huge thank you to Leo. Thank you so much uh, for your time and expertise here this evening. We really appreciate it. Uh, I imagine I probably speak for everybody here and that we're definitely going to be looking at things a little bit differently and maybe looking for some uh, mammalian friends along the way while we're on the birding trail. Um, really awesome work here. Thank you for the work that you're doing and you know its implication for bird conservation. And uh, with that said, we'll go ahead and close it out here. Uh, have a great evening, everybody. Once again, if you're not already a member or tuned in with uh, Sh Chicago Ornithological Society, definitely head over to our website, chicagobirder.org. Lots of great free trips and programs coming up, several of which are in the Calumet area where uh, Leo actually did a lot of his research. So definitely join us for some of those. Um, but have a great rest of your week, coming weekend. If we don't see if you guys between now have a great holiday as well. And uh, we hope to see you on a future program. Have a great evening, y'all.